normally there are lots of ways to ask this question. So I would say I'm not I'm not exactly not interested in post truth politics, but I you don't need me to come along and say, oh, you know, oh, aren't politicians terrible and isn't a political process, uh, isn't there something wrong with that? You know, it, it would be, uh, you could do that in a few sentences without much training. So I'm offering something else, which is a more sort of ever present or evergreen explanation for why things happen, so that you can then separate that from uh, some examples of politicians that you don't like or you don't like the things they say. Okay, so, so I'm not saying that there's nothing wrong with politics, I'm just saying. Uh, let's work out the policy process first and then work out if we still think there's something wrong with it. So, with this kind of, with a sciencey audience, this is my favourite because, I don't know if you know, there's a kind of hierarchy of the sciences up at the top. There's, I guess, there's kind of medicine and uh, natural sciences and that sort of thing. And quite a down, down there, there's kind of political science, you know. But I love this topic because now I'm at the top, right? Everyone wants to know, how does the policy process work? We've got all this great evidence. No one's paying attention to it, you know, so that's sort of normally normally popular. Okay, so I would normally start with three explanations for why people appear to ignore scientific evidence. Okay. The first is that people have a very narrow interpretation of what counts as good evidence. So, for example, the, the kind of classic caricature in uh, you know, evidence-based medicine, and it is a caricature, is, is the idea of there's a hierarchy of evidence, and at the top there are randomized controlled trials and there's systematic review. Further down, there's scientific expertise, and then at the bottom, there's practitioner experience and user feedback and something like that. Now, in other fields, uh, maybe like uh, social work or parts of education, uh, people are used to uh, flipping that hierarchy and saying at the top is reflection on personal experience, and uh, you know other things are lower. So I think the first explanation is that people have a very narrow interpretation of what counts as good evidence, and then it's that's what policymakers seem to be ignoring. But I think if you meet you know, you know kind of good examples of policymakers, they're sincere about collecting evidence, uh, but it's much more eclectic, much more pragmatic. So they're looking for many types and sources of evidence. So it just looks like some people are being ignored just because they're part of a far bigger picture. Uh, the second one is about information processing. Now I guess that's not a, there are lots of phrases that don't trip off the tongue, but I, we, would, we would talk routinely in post studies about information processing or bounded rationality or something like that. And the idea is, that uh, we would think there's an ideal type of organization that's comprehensively rational, so it can consider all information, you know, it can process an infinite amount of information in a short period of time. And then we say, well, what happens when policymakers are boundedly rational or organizations have to come up with shortcuts to consider enough evidence in a, an appropriate period of time so they can make choices? And so I think in psychology, increasingly, people would talk about two different kind of cognitive shortcuts. So we all can combine cognition and emotion to make choices quickly. So uh, if, I'm being, if I'm being kind of, if I'm trying to be annoying with some audiences, I will say uh, the distinction is often rational and irrational shortcuts. And you know, scientists think they're the rational objective ones and they think policymakers are the irrational ones and that explains what's going on. But in, when in, instead we're trying to work out how everyone combines these two things to make choices. And uh, so you've got a choice, I think, about how positively or negatively you want to describe these things. If you're not keen on uh, you know, um, these, these shortcuts, you'd say they're cognitive biases. So there's lots of examples of, of biases that we use, uh, you know, like, uh, uh, you know, availab you know the availability of information, I think what's that, fluency bias, or you know, anchoring bias, or status quo, that sort of thing. But if you're more keen on, on this kind of thing, which I am, you would, you would use Gigerenzer's phrase, which is fast and frugal heuristics. Which you know sounds much better, I think. You know, fast. The example there is a question like, uh, should, should I look after my children today? Well, I, you know, if I was being completely rational, I would do like an hour, a huge cost-benefit analysis. Uh, but if I'm being fast and frugal, I'll just use my emotions and make an instant choice to, to say, um, say yes. So. Um, uh, so that would be, if you think about that in terms, in terms of individual policymakers, then you would say, okay, well, you know that they're going to try and use these kind of so-called rational means to identify what are the best sources of information. But they're also going to draw on their emotions and their gut feeling and uh, habits and availability of information and their familiarity with existing evidence you know, to, to do things. I think that's kind of simple response is just to try and work out 
what you, how your audience thinks and how to adapt to it. The third reason is probably the one where um, I, I like the phrase, you know, I've, I've read this literature so you don't have to, and most uh, people don't, but policy process literature is really about complex policy making systems or environments. So you would say part of the reason it looks like people aren't paying attention to evidence is because the policy process is so complicated, there are so many people involved, that it's difficult to know at what point you would provide evidence uh, because there are not clear stages or you know functions in which uh, you know who is acting when and, and how they demand information. So you can sum this up in different ways. I think the classic, uh, sometimes you know the first, uh, uh, what's the word, encounter people have with policy studies is with the policy cycle. And it sort of gives you this kind of nice comforting image of how the policy process might work. So it would start with uh, defining a problem. So imagine if you're using evidence, this is what you, would, might, what you might want. D uh, you're defining a problem, the nature of a problem with evidence. You know, how many, for example, how many people smoke? How, how often do they smoke per day? You know, how many preventable diseases does it cause? How many preventable deaths? Uh, then you would say, okay, then they produce a policy solution, and that could be evidence-based. So with tobacco, it would be, you know, um, what's the relative effectiveness of a, a ban on smoking in public places compared to a ban on uh, advertising? You know? and then they legitimize, and then at some point, they evaluate with evidence. Did this intervention work well? And that, that evaluation would feed into the next stage. So if that is how you, if that's how the policy process worked, you could understand quite simply where you would inject evidence. And I think... If you have this image of policy making as an ideal, you know, this is how I'd like the world to, to work, then you'd think any departure from this kind of evidence-based cycle is a, is a bad thing. And unfortunately, <coughs> um, this is more like the policy process. And I like this because it's, um, this is, I think it's an kind of energy system in Thailand, you know, so it does work, but it looks, you know, I like the image because it's multiple interacting cycles producing all sorts of uh, outputs. And I like it because it, it looks kind of scary, I guess. You wouldn't want to get too close to it, I think. Uh, but it works, you know, the energy comes out. Energy goes in, energy comes out. You know, so it's a nice, uh, complicated system. Now, this is quite interesting as well. So it used to be that governments would project the cycle. They would essentially say, this is how we turn a manifesto commitment into policy. And it looks quite comforting because there are kind of causal arrows and everyone knows where they stand. So you can turn uh, explicit aims into policy. Now, the, one of the last executives to hold out on the, the kind of projection of that kind of image was the, the European Commission, partly because uh, they have a higher incentive to project an orderly evidence-based system because there's, there's not such a clear sense of you know, democratic elections. So uh, they say, at least, at least we've got this orderly process that you can understand. But now this is, uh, if you go to a kind of science policy conference and someone from the commission is talking, this is the thing they put up. Uh, and um, now there are still some arrows in there, you know, you can see. But I put it to you, they do not really lead anywhere sensible. They, uh, they're just, the cycle is in there. You can see the cycle right there. But, you know, the European Commission is now projecting mess. You know, imagine they're turning up to a conference officially and saying, here's our policy process. It's a big mess. Right, so, so I would look at that and think, why would you expect a kind of evidence-based process if that's what it looks like? So I've managed, I'm trying to lower your expectations so low, you know, and then we'll build them up again. It's a kind of positive talk. So uh, this is my version of uh, describing the policy process. Now you can see it's still quite comforting. People, people are comforted by arrows, you know, so that sort of looks like an arrow. Uh, but it's not supposed to denote uh, causation. You've got policy choice in the middle, and then you've got a series of concepts that describe key parts of a policy making environment. If, and I would normally say to you know uh, policy students, if you understand these um, terms, you understand the policy process. Uh, now, so for example, we would say uh, we know that instead of there being one center of government making all decisions, to which you can project evidence. Uh, there are many policymakers and influencers spread across many levels and types of government. In each of the venues that they operate, they have their own rules that you have to understand. Some of them are formal and written down and well understood, but most rules within institutions are informal, not written down, and often not communicated verbally. 
market. So that's a bit that's unfortunate, you know. So, um, but I would normally I would say to you know students, what are the rules of the university that are unwritten, you know? And you know they'll come up with kind of bland. We've got to turn up here or else we'll get kicked out. That sort of rule, but that's written down, you know. But really, the biggest informal rule, at least where I work, is that if I were to ask you a question in this context and you were a student. And no, under no circumstances would you answer me. You know, you would. Uh, so everyone knows to kind of, but you know, no, no eye contact, and then just wait it out. He's not gonna, he's not gonna, uh, you know, do it too long. But I mean, if, I would watch out. If, if you do that, I, I would just wait five minutes if, if need be. Uh, but that's one of those. No, that's one of those. It's unwritten. You know, people don't get together outside and say right under no circumstances. Speak to this guy, you know, but everyone knows the rule. Okay, so that's what we're trying to understand. What are these rules that are unwritten? But the same with networks are relationships between policymakers and influencers, and they follow particular rules to build up trust. So you'd up and say, you know, there are three ways to build up trust within these networks. Uh, okay, let me see if you can remember them. The um, one is uh, you recognize a, an authority, you know, trust in an authority figure, an expert or, or an elected policymaker. Another is you share their beliefs. Another is you have worked together in the past and you have proved, proven to be reliable. The third one is probably the most important. You know, people trust people who they know they can they can rely on. They, they don't, you know, do the wrong thing with the information. Then we would say you know people are responding to socioeconomic context and sort of routine and unpredictable events. And there's a sort of a language in policymaking departments or venues that is often spoken to communicate uh, deep, deeply held beliefs. So the classic, I think, would be um, you know, Keynesian economics. Do you know, remember the, Keyn the Keynesian days? So people would talk about, you know, should we, put up, should we uh, make more capital investment to boost the economy? Should we raise our lower interest rates to deal with uh, you know, unemployment and, and um, inflation? But they wouldn't have a first principles debate on Keynesian economics each day. The, the language re would reflect a, a widespread agreement about what they were doing and what, how they would do it. And you find that in lots of other areas where, you know, say public health is a kind of language of you know, evidential hierarchies or high quality evidence that people might not always uh, reinforce, but that is the kind of, the way you build your reputation in those kind, of, those kind of terms. So if you can understand all those things, you can think about how to be influential within that process. Okay, so, so any questions before, I'm just taking a breath, any questions? Or I give you your five solutions that that aren't really solutions. That is, I don't want to get your hopes up. It's all kind of it's those fake solutions you get from, uh, from consultants. Uh, okay, no questions. So far. Okay, so five responses. One is uh, decide what you mean by evidence-based policy making if that's what you want. So I would see it very much as a political slogan, not not an ambition, but just something that people say uh, to you know to try and influence debate. Uh, okay. Then uh, I think if people spend some time in this field and they use the phrase evidence based, they often end you kind know, of a little bit jaded and, they, and then they say, oh, I've come along and it's really evidence informed. This is the phrase I'm using. Now that's still, I don't, still don't like that term very much because, you know, something like, um, you know, homeopathy is kind of uh, medicine informed, isn't it? It's kind of one part active ingredient. And Million parts of water or something like that. So that's I mean that's kind of that could be evidence informed. You know, it could be that kind of concentration. But then a big question would be define what counts as evidence, and if that's a defendable uh, approach to take within a policy process in which lots of people will not really agree with you, and what what counts as good evidence. Okay, so that's a nice, simple one. I think they they go up in a hierarchy of difficulty. Right. So define your terms. That sounds simple enough. The second would be to find ways to respond to the policymaker psychology we talked about. Now, I think there are two key responses. One is you're trying to reduce uncertainty. So that is uh, uncertainty as a lack of information on a policy problem and a solution. So produce good evidence and present it concisely. I think that's the usual advice to scientists. You know, uh, think about how you communicate these things in, a, in an accessible way. But the second one is more important, which is reduce ambiguity. So ambiguity is there are many ways to understand the same policy issue and turn it into a policy problem. 
So for example, you know, fracking can be uh, largely an economic issue. If we do it, we can boost the economy, or it can be a, a climate change problem, because if we do it, it'll you know, create uh, you know, huge environmental damages. And that matters. You know, the definition of a problem matters because it determines the demand for evidence. If you think of fracking as an economic issue, your demand for evidence is economic. How much uh, will this boost the economy? If it's uh, climate change, it would be how, you know, what's going to be the environmental impact? You know, and you, maybe sometimes people will ask all of those questions, but you know, I wouldn't, I wouldn't uh, hold my breath. Uh, so this is really about persuasion. It's about storytelling with evidence. So it's not only about saying, here's particular evidence on a topic. It's about here's why you should care about it and working out what the audience is thinking. And if you can use a story to reinforce that way of thinking or try and challenge it some way. So that one still sounds, I'm not giving you time to think about that, but that sounds quite straightforward, doesn't it? Until you, until you go away and think about the implications, right? Okay, so the third one is reject symbols of policy making and then think about actually what you would do if the world were much more complicated, which I'll go into in, in some depth in a, in a couple of minutes. But before then, the fourth one is to think about uh, what actually counts as good policy making. Because I think lots of people equate evidence-based policy making with good policy making. You know, it's, uh, it's what's the word uh, when you don't think about something? Self-evidently good. Now, I'll just put you to you very quickly that there are many models of good policy making. Evidence-based is one of them, but there are also lots of defendable models of policy making that don't have the word evidence in them at all. Uh, for example, okay, and I'll, I just want you to trust me that this is a good table that's coming up, and you don't have to read the words too much. We don't have time reading all the words, but just it's just like it's a good table that you're going to want to read about more when you've finished. Okay, that's that's our aim, so don't bother with the text. But um. And this is a kind of simplified version. But essentially, you would say, imagine the question was, how do you combine good evidence with good policy making? And that's, uh, let's say this is more kind of social policy, where you're trying to think about, should I have the same policy spread about across a whole political system? Or should I invite more kind of localist, uh, co-produced policy by lots of different areas across a political system? So you've got two questions you're asking at the same time. And I think your answers can go together in consistent models. The first one relates to that hierarchy I was talking about. You know, RCTs are the gold standard. If you take that model, then your, your aim is to produce a model or intervention that is uniform. But this idea is you've measured the effect of a particular intervention. You've measured a dosage, like a dosage of medicine. And to make sure you provide the correct dosage, you provide the same model spread across the population. So that's consistent with governmental centralization and uh, very little local discretion. So one, one answer to that question is RCTs and centralization. That's good policy making. I would say an equally defendable proposition is its polar opposite, which is uh, focused very much on localism, respect for service users, respect for local communities. You use that language of co-production, co-producing policy, trying to bring together lots of different perspectives and forms of knowledge. and um, uh, telling stories about your knowledge of particular situations and inviting people to learn from them and spreading good practice that way. Now that is almost the opposite because you've, you've subverted the hierarchy of evidence and you've gone for localism versus centralism. Now I've given, given you a kind of spectrum of good policy making or good evidence knowledge based policy making and then there are lots of different examples within there like uh, the improvement method that uh, is very interesting, but you know, for another time. Okay, but you imagine the point would be, you know, you're, you're trying to define what evidence-based policy making is. But then you quickly have to define how that relates to, you know, to policy making in general. Okay. So now this is my favourite. Uh, so this is essentially to, to work out how far you will go to privilege the use of evidence in policy making. Okay, so I'm giving you a kind of Essentially, I'm giving you a range of options from a training course at university to give you some communication skills to um, you know, thinking about how you can be more kind of Machiavellian and uh, what's the word, kind of um, manipulative. Right. So, um, and the punchline is, you know, you go for the manipulative. Or not, I'll get something. Uh, so, here are the kind of um, 
things that you might, uh, types of advice you might uh, translate from the, the way I described the policy making environment. They map on quite well to studies of uh, people who have some experience of engagement in government science advice, the kind of tips they would give to individuals. They map on quite well. So uh, find out uh, where, where, where the action is, because there are many policymakers spread across government. Therefore, you need to work out who is uh, actually responsible for the issue you're involved in. Learn the rules in which uh, they operate, the organizations you're talking about. You know, so those informal rules I was talking about. Learn the language of the, the, um, the venue. Uh, build trust and form alliances within these places. And exploit events and windows of opportunity. And that sounds uh, fantastically simple uh, until you think about it. Okay, but I'm not giving you time to think about it. But essentially, these are kind of Herculean tasks. You know, I don't know. Does that make sense? Is that a phrase that you, you know, Herculean, the kind of impossible, uh, the labors? You know, okay, but it looks good. Uh, but imagine, how, you know, just think about how you do these things. Learn the rules of an organization. Given that we've just agreed they're kind of informal and they're not communicated verbally, how, how are you going to do that? Uh, you know, without working for the organization. Okay, so you can do it like this as well. Think about the policy process and the role of evidence within it. So you've got kind of, this is easier, you know, three steps. So you use evidence, you're framing evidence and telling a story to get attention for a policy issue and, and to get attention for a particular way to think about it. So think about the tobacco example. The success story was, in reframing tobacco as a global public health epidemic that had to be solved urgently because it was a huge cause of preventable death. If successful, and that helps influence the policy making environment in which people operate. So for example, the health department becomes the key organization and its rules tend to privilege scientific medical information and uh, downplay you know, economic uh, industry information. And then exploit uh, windows of opportunity. So if you look at tobacco as a whole, it's a collection of you know six to twelve policy instruments. Each of them pretty much introduced at different times, or incrementally over time. You know, so if you think about the history of tobacco control in places like UK, Australia, New Zealand, they were done on a kind of incremental basis that led up to more recent things like uh, ban on smoking in public places and uh, plain packaging and so on. Start, you know, so they would start with high. So that would be, if you think, this is how, you know, a, a, a scenario in which evidence would play a, a part in a wider policy making system. Okay, now, uh, let's see, how long have we got? How long, I meant to ask, I, I, I could do it by body language, but how long, uh, oh, that was a nice kind of polite laugh. That's actually, that's kind of five minutes. To give me a, uh, so here's another response, which is, Instead of thinking individually, you think about how can organizations respond to this. So this is a, a European Commission initiative I helped write up and essentially said, these are the eight skills of organizations that uh, if you have all of those skills, you connect uh, knowledge supply and knowledge demand. Okay, if very quickly, the interesting thing is only one of them is about evidence and it's about synthesizing evidence, not um, so we're producing new evidence. And I think, you know, the scientific, uh, what's the word? Losing all the words. The scientific imperative is to produce new knowledge, but the policy making imperative is to synthesize that knowledge. So the only other interesting I'll say, thing I'll say, you can, you can read up on this more, is um, advising policymakers. Now, often there's a kind of scientific identity that says there's a clear divide between scientists who are objective and policymakers who are not, and people don't want to cross the line between, between those things. So the European Commission pretty much says. We're not interested in people who won't give us advice based on their information. So, uh, option three is it's uh, so if you humor me, there is a thought process here. Uh, it's a kind of ladder of ethical choices, right? And I didn't want to just give you a step ladder from you know B and Q. I don't know what's the kind of Australian equivalent B and Q, like a hardware store, right? Okay, so I didn't want to say you know it's like a, a ladder from there. You know, it's more like a, a Bosch Bosch's ladder into Doom, you know. So, uh, but this is imagine your focus is very much on the means justify the ends. No, hang on, the ends justify the means, right? So you're thinking, right, the end is very evidence based policy making. So I must do all I can to make sure that is, that happens. So uh, I'm giving you kind of a very kind of quick tour of uh, what how you could turn policy studies into this kind of advice. 
first one is kind of low, low bar ethical dilemma is uh, better storytelling. So you can read this kind of stuff in which they are starting to test the relative effects of different kinds of stories. So all these stories have the same format, but they have different characters and different morals and that sort. So they've had some interesting work on different climate change stories, which one of them, which, which ones are more effective than others when you're trying to tell a story about how to solve those ones. But the thing I would take from this, the reason why it's partly at the bottom of the ladder is these stories, that they're, the effective stories tend to reinforce people's beliefs. They don't change anyone's minds. You know, the most, the most effective ones are essentially you're, you're trying to turn someone from uh, I agree with you, but I don't care, and to I agree with you, and I do care, or something like that. It's not about, you know, uh, I, you know, you've suddenly, you know, give me a eureka moment. The second one is about being entrepreneurial. Now, the tricky thing here is I think people uh, associate being entrepreneurial and exploiting windows of opportunity as a kind of individual thing. So, for example, if, uh, see if this has happened to you, if, uh, Someone has sent you an email uh, by mistake. Have you ever had that? And uh, said a few choice words about you, and they were trying to do it behind your back. Then they would send you another email to apologize. And then that's a window of opportunity to get something off them, you know, because they're feeling guilty and uh, they'll do anything for 10 minutes. You know, for that day, you can really get something you want. So I think people think that's a window of opportunity, right? But actually, policy studies, it's really about uh, a, a political system where those opportunities might happen every 20 or 30 years. And they're akin to space launches in some way that you just have to trust me on this. But, uh, but essentially, a window of opportunity is uh, policymaker attention rises to a particular problem. There is a feasible political s solution already waiting, ready to be attached to it. And policymakers have the motive and opportunity to adopt it. And most of the explanation is a kind of environmental type explanation. So actually, Kingdon uses the phrase surfers on a big wave. I, it didn't occur to me until now. This would really kind of, this would be appropriate here, right? But surfers, and, and, the, and, and I'll put it to you. I don't know, does, any, does anyone surf? I don't really surf. I'll get one. one oh, yeah, okay, two, two will do. Right. Uh, it's not really the skills of the surfer that matter. It's the environment, isn't it? It's the size of the waves and the fact that there's the water's out there. You know, you couldn't do it in here. I'll put it to you, yeah. You could be really skilled at surfing, but you do it in here, you're, you're stuffed, aren't you? You're in the environment. So I think that's the, that, that kind of explanation. It's an environmental one. Okay. Now, then we get slightly trickier. I've, I've tried to cover up all the words because you, people try and read words as soon as you put them up. But essentially, this kind of uh, advocacy coalition framework says people go into politics to turn their beliefs into policy. They form coalitions with people who agree with them. And they compete with coalitions of people who disagree with them. Now, in the nutshell, advice for this can be, if you're presenting evidence, there's no point in presenting it to a, the other coalition that disagree with, disagrees with you. Focus all your time and attention on the coalition of people who already share your beliefs. Okay, now that, so that's like an example where uh, it, it seems less, uh, it seems further away from a kind of scientific identity about you know, wider dissemination. But it's probably a better use of your time if, if you're speaking to your choices. Should I speak with people who will agree with or pick up everything I say, or an audience who will actually just uh, dismiss me as uh, oh, <laughs> uh, as as you know, kind of lying or you know, uh, I mean, you get that. Don't you? Politicians just say, okay, I don't believe this evidence at all. You know, so but one implication is you just don't waste your time because you'll just uh, you will never you will never get anywhere with that. Yeah, two more, and then I can stop. Uh, this this is probably one of the most researched policy studies, and essentially says if you line up all policy change ever, you will find a huge number of small policy changes and a large number. No, sorry, a small number of huge policy changes. Now let me say that again. Right, it's a huge number of small policy changes. Let's put a bunch around here, uh, and a small number of huge policy changes. If you measure anything, your know, budgets or you know, kind of legislative policy changes. Now, the main explanation for that is people can only pay attention to a tiny proportion of uh, the policy process. So it'd be everyone is paying almost no attention to almost everything all of the time, something like that. Okay, that explains this distribution. So 
there are two things you can take from this. One is I want to find out how I can be the exception and generate attention for my one issue at the expense of 999 others. Okay, to to try and be the the outliers. But uh, another approach is to um, exploit the fact that people pay almost no attention to almost everything, define issues as scientific and technical, and therefore make sure that no one is interested in, in them because they can't understand them and they don't feel they have a legit legitimate role in them. Okay. So that's your, we're going up in the ethical dilemma. So one is exclude almost everyone from policy debate by saying, oh, this is super sciencey, you're not going to understand it. Now I should say, I should have prefaced this at the start, I've forgotten. I would say, these studies are what people do. Okay, I'm not saying you should necessarily do them. I'm saying this, this is what people do, and you have to work out if you're going to do the same. Or if, you know, if you want to do something different, how could you, you know, how could you do it? And the final one would be in that context. So there's a large literature that essentially says, policymakers uh, use their own emotions, or they exploit the emotions of populations who construct social stereotypes of target populations to decide who are the good people and the bad people, therefore who deserve government praise and who deserve government punishments. And in a nutshell, you might say this kind of characterizes a lot of the most visible policy process. And your biggest dilemma for people providing evidence is, do you want to routinely challenge those biases uh, and likely face uh, you know, no influence within the policy process? Or do you want to exploit those terrible characterizations of populations so that you can maximize the use of your evidence within the process. Okay. I'll leave that one for the hanger. Uh, so, I mean, these are the take homes that I guess I, can, I should have forgot. You know, I could, have, I could say anything just now because most people are just reading the text. I should, I should sing or something. Uh, okay. But essentially, that was kind of the, the take homes. Uh, you're, trying to, you're trying to exploit. The psychology of choice, the way that people make uh, cognitive shortcuts to information, but to do it in an ethical way. Now, I think usually the answer is tell a more convincing story that's concise and engages the emotions. And things like that. But I think the more I talk about these things, the more I think that that's, that's a very limited response. You know, you can train people as storytellers, but if you don't train them in how the policy process works, then they're going to you know tell excellent stories to individuals and not make a huge difference. Uh, so, I, I, I forgot I was, I was going to make this a positive presentation, uh, but essentially I was going to say at the end, you would say, you know, people say be entrepreneurial, but uh, most entrepreneurs fail. Uh, right, okay, I, I'll try and, I'll smile, look, I'm smiling as I say that. Yeah, so, um, and the opportunities and rewards are not shared equally. So a lot of this is about, imagine advice to scientists in their training, develop these skills. Okay, uh, put yourself out there and tell good stories to the population if possible. But the opportunities are not shared equally, and the 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 um the punishments are not shared equally. So, I mean, in a nutshell, you know, kind of white male professors uh, have more most of the opportunities to do this stuff, and they don't get the abuse, uh, the routine abuse. So I've only been abused with the serious words, you know, on social media once in my my career. And I know, for example, if if you're if you're doing you know things like you know feminist research and social then you're kind of, um, kind of destined for a life of, of abuse on social media. So these are things to take into account when we're thinking about you know, early career training and stuff. And, uh, and I think you can legitimately, this is here's a more positive point, you can legitimately go through all of those things I said and conclude uh, I, I don't think I should be involved in any kind of wider communication with the population because it sounds like I'm better off being an academic, specializing in academic and uh, trusting other people to do this kind of work. Uh, okay, that was, that was a kind of positive end, wasn't it? Yeah, okay, right, okay, uh, thank you, thank you. We have some time right now for questions and then we're gonna move into a, a panel discussion. Does anyone, we've got a roving mic, do any of you have any immediate questions for Paul from his presentation? One, two, and... I would be interested in, in your views on, on time factors with the political actors, with the 24-7 media cycle, if, if perhaps policy, um, evidence-based policy could be, be delivered in better bite-sized 
parcel, uh, parcels for them to be able to uh, help with the, the policy implementation. I think if, if people care about it, they'll pay attention to it. If they don't, they won't. So there's only so far I think I can have a short message will, will work. Because I mean, certainly I follow 7,000 accounts on Twitter, for example. And I'm scrolling through them and it, they're all short. You know, it, I don't think that's going to, that's the dif difference on its own. Um, and I think that would feed into the sense that I think people used to think that we were solving some of these problems I talked about because the problem was a lack of knowledge. The more knowledge we produced, the better off we'd be. But increasingly we're finding that there's almost an infinite amount of information out there. The, the task is to ignore almost all of it. Uh, now, I think being, you know, presenting short messages is one of those ways to reduce cognitive load. But I think that, that I would have to be more than that. I think that I, th I think if we're thinking about encouraging people to pay attention to the you know the right evidence, then it's to I think it's more a question of uh, credibility. It's about uh, in, instead of thinking about how they deal with a whole bunch of information, it's about thinking how can I persuade them at the start to think where will I go for my search, and not go to Twitter at all, but to go to a database of evidence that's, that's good stuff. Yeah. Okay. Mm. So, so uh, it, it would be about implementation and um, uh, how it could be delivered in an incremental fashion. Mm. So, okay, we've got a, a, um, a policy which we want to deliver. Mm. Um, we, so how do we accommodate the politician in being able to, to, to get it through? It, it needs to be in a, in a time frame and a velocity that, that, that can help people. Okay, so if, if, if you're thinking policymakers only have a few years to carry out their aims, then how can researchers provide timely evidence for them to help them do it? Yeah, okay, yeah. So, yeah, so that would be a must. I mean, I think that would be, that would fit into, so the, the kind of European Commission work of doing, they, their emphasis is very much on, yeah, we recognize that policymakers often need this information very quickly and that they will, uh, they will need a kind of general sense of what's out there. So the key currency is these synthetic accounts of what everything adds up to, rather than saying, here's the latest report or something like that. And there is kind of, um, I think the key there is, is the academic or scientific incentive to do that kind of work. And you do see it in some fields, like the systematic review of RCTs is, is the kind of high status work. I don't think many policymakers are reading those reviews, but you could you can uh, summarize them. And it would be the same with, um, you know, um, I, th I think if, if we're being pragmatic researchers, you would say, um, you know, this is this this will not benefit my career as much in terms of it's the top it's the you know it's a new article in the top journal, but it has a, a much more obvious impact, and you know I, I came into research to produce research and to have some kind of real world impact. So that's the way to do it, you know, synth synthetic stuff. I mean, it does produce some. Um, uh, I think it does require a lot of trust in the messenger, you know, because you're essentially saying you no longer have to read any of this literature. You can trust me that I've come up with the, with the goods, you know, the right, the right uh, material, just like I've done there. I mean, I summarized 50 years of policy studies there. You, you, um, you take it in trust or not, you know. Uh, we seem to be operating in the time of peak fake news at the moment. Um, and I'm interested in um, how scientists who are, you know, we're used to being very careful about what we say and so on. How do we best influence policy in that time when really knowledge seems to be democratized or if enough people say it enough, it almost becomes true. H how, do we, how do we operate in that world and how do we influence policy in the, in the face of that sort of you know, evidence? Yeah. Well, I mean, I have, I have my own views on this. And I think, I mean, I've kind of developed them just to be annoying to uh, researchers, okay? So I think one response is to not use that language at all. Uh, because I think you can tell who someone is by key terms, uh, post-truth politics, fake news. Um, you know, people are, I would use that word, dafties. People are dafties. They don't understand the world and scientists do, you know? So how can we get them, the dafties, to pay more attention to us, the intelligent people? And I, I would just kind of dispense with that language and say, you know, uh, uh, how can we communicate good evidence well? And that's a kind of more consistent message. Uh, I, I, don't, I don't think, um, 
I mean, I'm not an anthropologist, but I do, I do go, I go to a lot of these conferences and I think the language that people use about post-truth says more about them and their biases than it does about the world. Uh, so I would, uh, or uh, I would think either, you know, uh, you would change your outlook or just change the words you use so that people don't quite know that that's your outlook. Hi, thanks very much, Paul. Um, and following on from that question, you've talked a bit uh, about how to understand what goes on in the policy space and sort of how to play along in that world. But there's implicit in that, and what you just said, is really the constraint of that interaction that's provided by uh, people being trained in a technically rationalist worldview. And do you have any thoughts on how to step back from that comprehensively rationalist worldview that people have been trained in so that they can more comfortably play in that space and, and move across that boundary? Uh, well, yeah. Um, I mean, a lot of the stuff I say, people are, you know, people are quite receptive to it. Uh, I don't know if it's just a superficial sense, you know, people being polite and then talking about, you want to leave. But uh, the, um, I, th I think um, it doesn't take too much. I, th I think uh, we can exploit the fact that people who have those kind of understandings, it's based on a superficial analysis of the policy process. So you might say, well, you know, people have beliefs about things, but if they're if they're based on a superficial engagement, then they're not they're not too difficult to change. You know, people don't have a kind of fundamental uh, belief that the world is a kind of rationalist place. You know, so it's not too difficult. In if you do an MPP, you know, it, it takes two weeks to just uh, it takes me two weeks to break students down into you know like an army type scenario where you know they they reject all the beliefs they had about politics in week two, and then you know another ten weeks to build them up again. No, so it's not, you know, it's not too difficult. But I think part, I mean, part of it would be, um, it's not, that there is a downside to that because essentially the message we were given is the policymaking process is so complex. Uh, if you go too far, it can be an overwhelming message. You can think, well, no individual can make a difference within this system because yeah, we don't understand it. So I think we try and focus on some kind of balance there about developing skills that, that people seem to have when they're influential in the policy process, and then encouraging a sense of pragmatism that the same skill, the same input of energy can have no impact for a long period and then a maximal impact suddenly. So I think it's that kind of, that kind of simple messages there you could take that you, you don't take too personally that people are ignoring you for a long time because the next day they could suddenly think you're the, you're the, you know, the greatest thing, and you're just saying the same stuff. There you go, that was it. Right, remember that one. That was a positive one. Uh, what do you think? Uh, thanks, Paul. My name's Ben Newell. I'm a professor of cognitive psychology here at UNICEF. So I was interested in your picking up on psychology of choice and cognitive heuristics and so on. Um, I wondered if you had any comments about the rise of behavioral insights and the nudge movement and libertarian paternalism and all these mm. kind of notions and whether you think that's uh, a good way to try and capitalize on these shortcuts or biases, whatever you want to think about them, or a somewhat nefarious way to, ma to manipulate people. Yeah, okay, so, I mean, that's one of those words that manipulation, I think, I guess people mostly think it's a, a bad thing. Yeah, you don't want to do it because you're, um, because I, I guess you're saying, you're trying to get people to do what you want and you're deliberately not giving them enough information to make their own choices. And, yeah, so that sounds, sounds bad. Um, I think I think I think there's been a rise in that kind of policy tool because it's relatively simple because you don't have to face the most difficult one is is redistributive policy where you people know that you've taken resources from them to give to other people. So this one doesn't seem so bad because you're essentially individualizing behavior and saying we will influence your choices at an individual level. And you don't have to worry too much about context or inequalities or something like that. So you, you can you can see why it's popular because uh, out of all the options policymakers have, this looks like the easiest one. Um, so I think that's why they choose them rather than based on their likelihood effectiveness. Uh, I mean, I suppose I, I'm sort of waiting for, I suppose there's some discussion in the literature about what happens when people know they're being nudged and if they'll, if they'll simply react against it, even if they would, would have done it otherwise. So for example, I when I see blue feet 
on escalators to tell me where to stand. I always <laughs> sit in the opposite, just just to stick it to some random person that put them there. You know, so I don't know. I think that's I think that's the worry, isn't it? That they'll work to some extent. People may change their behaviour, but we don't know if 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 this is if it will stick. My question's kind of along the same lines. I'm um, very keen in the area of um, driving cultural change, particularly towards women. Um, I was just wondering if you think that policy can drive rapid cultural change without highly regulated um, things go along with it. And yeah, is it, can you drive rapid cultural change without regulation? Okay, I mean, I suppose the 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 honest answer is I don't know. Uh, I mean, I think we all don't know, um, and I and I think when you don't know, you would just have to make these choices based on uncertainty. So, for example, uh, the, I suppose the key one is uh, you know how do you encourage a fifty fifty balance of uh, women and men in in par you know elected in parliament? Do you hope for cultural change over the long term or do you have you know all women shortlist and that sort of thing and my gut is the shortlist because I wouldn't trust people to you I don't know I think you'd be waiting you could wait 100 years for it to happen and you think well uh, given that uncertainty I want to make the choice now to make, make that happen and that's more about exercising power than putting hope in humanity uh, uh, society well I, I, I don't know I mean I, I suppose I would I'll um What's the word when you try and get out of something by giving you some someone else? Someone else. There's a there is some work on this about uh, st storytelling for cultural change, uh, and it's all oh, right. Uh, excellent self publicity. So I um I edit this open access series of uh, articles in a journal Palgrave Communications, and one of them is storytelling for policy change by Brett Davidson, and he works for the Open Society Foundation in New York, and and they're interested in funding projects that do the kind of work you're talking about. And they, so he goes through case studies of things they've funded and tries to uh, think through how, how it works. But they're fantastically hard to evaluate, you know, cultural changes and that sort of thing. So, I mean, I think you would get a gut. Some of these things are working, but you would have to, it would be a kind of gut feeling that it was working rather than, you know, some kind of a good evaluation. Of it.